Thank you very much for starting us off like that. Good morning, Birmingham Unitarian Church. Good morning. It is good to be together again. Whether you are joining us here in the sanctuary, remotely via Zoom, or watching this recording later, it is good to connect with you. As a multi-platform church, it is important for us to build a bridge between online and in-person participants. We call this connection opportunity greeting our virtual neighbors. First, we will project the image of folks who are currently on Zoom, put your cameras on, um, up there on our screen and ask them to turn their cameras on and give us a wave. Now, we who are gathered in person will turn to face the camera in the back of the sanctuary and give them a wave. If you are visiting us for the first time, welcome. We're glad you're here. If you are with us in the sanctuary, we invite you to join us after service for coffee and conversation in our social hall, which is located to the left as you exit the sanctuary. If you are with us on Zoom, we invite you to stay on the call for a virtual coffee hour immediately after service ends. Whenever and however we connect with BUC, we are building BUC at home, on campus, in the world, every day, we are Birmingham Unitarian Church, and we are building the beloved community. We join with other Unitarian Universalists around the world as we light our chalice. The words of today's chalice lighting are by the Reverend Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Religion and evolution should neither be confused nor divorced. They are destined to form one single continuous organism in which their respective lives prolong, are dependent on, and complete one another without being identified or lost. Since it is in our age that the duality has become so markedly apparent, it is for us to effect this synthesis. All right, uh, please rise in body and spirit and sing hymn number 158 in our gray hymnal, Praise the Source of Faith, faith and Learning. <laughs> Praise the source of faith and learning. 
that has sparked and stoked the mind with a passion for discerning how the world has been designed. Let the sense of wonder flowing from the wonders we survey keep our faith truth in part far beyond our calculation lies a death we cannot sound where the purpose for creation and the pulse of life are found may our faith In our modern culture, there is a tension between science and spirituality. It's as if the two ways of looking at the world are opposite extremes of the same scale. Some say that viewing the world from a scientific understanding strips away the mystery and the meaning. Others say that a truly spiritual experience of the world requires the abandonment of evidence and reason. This morning, we would like to suggest to you that science and spirituality are not contradictory, but complementary, not opposite, but orthogonal. So what does that mean? <laughs> Rather than thinking of spirituality as opposite directions along a single dimension, let's imagine a two-dimensional space where along the horizontal axis, we have science. Along the vertical axis, we have spirituality. This allows us to move to the right to increase our scientific understanding of the world without sacrificing spirituality. It allows us to increase our spirituality without abandoning science. In both cases, we can intensify our experience of the world without sacrificing mystery or reason. The horizontal axis is what Michael Dowd, in his book, Thank God for Evolution, calls public revelation. It is a view of, the, of objective reality on which we can all agree by applying reason to evidence. It produces repeatable results. You and I, given time, will arrive at the same conclusion given the same evidence and the appropriate application of reason. 
Its purest language is math, but Michael Dowd uses a more colorful, colorful term uh, of day language, science, public revelation, day language. This is how we explain the world in the bright light of day. The vertical axis is what Dowd calls private revelation. It is the experience of reality that is highly subjective. It produces unique results from person to person and even from time to time with the same person. Its language is metaphor, literally in poetry and storytelling, but also in music and sculpture and painting and dance, any artistic endeavor. Dowd refers to this as night language, spirituality, private revelation, night language. This is how we explain the world at night, around the campfire with our people, or alone in bed with our worries. Unfortunately, our culture has relegated day language to all things secular and night language to all things religious. We think we Unitarian Universalists at VUC can provide the bridge across this gap. In this service, Tom will show the richness of night language in story and song to explain the scientific. I will reflect on how truth and meaning fit in this two-dimensional space. And Keith will reflect on the potential of synthesis of science and spirituality and where that brings us. Okay, here we go. Hi. <laughs> this story is called Mammals Who Morph, and it comes from the third book in the Universe Tells Our Evolution Story series by Jennifer Morgan. Illustrations are by Dana Lynn Anderson, and this story should be told in the voice of our universe. However, Morgan Freeman was busy, so you'll have to settle for me. <laughs> my dear Earthling, your Earth is one of my most creative planets. Over the last 65 million years, Earth dreamed up all kinds of mammal Earthlings. How did Earth's mammal dreams come true, and how did you become you? Once upon a time, long, Long, long ago, giant dinosaurs roamed everywhere and mousy mini-mammals lived in trees. Dinosaurs ruled the days, but mini-mammals ruled the nights. When the great meteor hit 65 million years ago, Earth roared with earthquakes and fire, then went dark and very cold. Every single dinosaur died except for their descendants, the birds. But your ancestors, the mammals, scraped by. Earth wasted no time filling in empty spaces left by the dinosaurs. Little by little, land, sea, and air began to shape the mammals to come. Trees sculpted hands for grasping branches. Land molded paws and hooves. Water formed fins, air shaped wings. It took millions and millions of years. 50 million years ago, steamy, hot rainforests stretched from pole to pole. One mammal you know, the horse, already trotted about. It was about the size of a cat. And still, there are no humans, but there are primates in trees, like lemurs and monkeys. Over a long time, monkeys evolved into another kind of primate, apes with tails. Oh, apes without tails. I just read that. <laughs> Curious and playful, th those apes loved the social life. In one ape group, young daughters and sons learned from their moms how to crack nuts with a rock. Wow, apes were using tools. In Africa, 
Some of Earth's awesome apes stopped walking on all fours. They stood upright. Two-legged, two-handed Earthlings began roaming the Earth. Humans mixed and morphed and turned into another kind of human, one with a powerful imagination. Who were they? Homo sapiens, the humans like you who live today. Across the planet, they told stories about how I, the universe, was born. Then a strange thing happened. On every continent about 10,000 years ago, humans noticed that plants make seeds that sprout into more plants. Human began to, humans began to grow their own fruits and vegetables. They grew grains too, wheat, rice, and corn. They saw how life came out of the earth and grew with sunlight. What great mystery. They thanked sun and earth. What wizard humans are, but their cleverness has a dark side. Humans became the most powerful earthlings of all, but they forgot that they are made out of Earth's air, water, and soil. They cut down trees and put buildings everywhere. Then whole species went extinct, never to live again. What good can possibly come of this mess? In every crisis before, a surprising breakthrough happened. Crises can unleash my cosmic creative powers. Today, my creative powers also live inside of you, the powers of imagination, love, and decision-making. Never forget that you are part of me. Remember, too, that I am inside you. Your bones are hardened with calcium made by stars. Your backbone was fashioned by fish. The deepest part of your brain was built by reptiles. The love you feel for another deepened inside the very first mammals. My story lives inside of you, and the story continues with you. Follow your dreams, my dear earthlings. They are my dreams, too. Love your universe. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas. Environmental action, economic justice, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month, or in the summer, each month and a half. The Palate Collection recipient for the first half of the summer is Samaritus Southeast Michigan Refugee Resettlement and Placement Program. Funds will be used towards the resettlement of more than 850 adults and children this year who are fleeing the ravages of war, persecution, and violence from countries including Syria, Afghanistan, Ukraine, Iraq, Venezuela, and Colombia. They also stand ready to welcome individuals and families from Africa in Southeast Michigan. The target beneficiaries of this grant are for refugees participating in employment programs whereby financial assistance is needed to help them eliminate barriers to employment such as transportation, vocational training, and childcare for newcomers to not only attain a job, but retain that employment to be financially stable and self-sufficient. Let there be an offering in support of our beloved community and organizations that build the world we dream about. This morning's offering will now be received with gratitude. <laughs>
We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and dedicate ourselves to its service. We come to the time in our worship service where we share the joys and sorrows in our community. Start with a, uh, a joy that was uh, posted online from Kelly Taylor. On July 4th, I celebrated my 60th birthday. While 60 is not necessarily my favorite number, I'm very happy to still be here enjoying birthdays. Happy sweet 16. Dick Wiseman, AD, ran a 5K race last weekend. He's in training at the Stony Creek Metro Park <laughs> on Sunday mornings. In 2012, he ran the entire Free Press Marathon. This year, he plans to run the half marathon. And into every life, there is both joy and sorrow. From Ed Sharples. I grieve the death of my sister-in-law, Carolyn Sharples, wife of my brother, Jim. Carol died early Friday, and I shall be with family several days in Westport, Massachusetts. On Tuesday, I shall lead Carol's memorial service. May her family find peace. We also hold in our hearts all of the unspoken joys and sorrows among us. Wilderness by Carl Sandburg. There is a wolf in me, fangs pointed for tearing gashes, a red tongue for raw meat and the hot lapping of blood. I keep this wolf because the wilderness gave it to me and the wilderness will not let it go. There is a fox in me, a silver gray fox. I sniff and guess. I pick things out of the wind and air. I nose in the dark night and take sleepers and eat them and hide the feathers. I circle and loop and double cross. There is a hog in me, a snout and a belly, a machinery for eating and grunting, a machinery for sleeping satisfied in the sun. I got this too from the wilderness, and the wilderness will not let it go. There is a fish in me. I know I came from salt blue water gates. I scurried with shoals of herring. I blew water spouts with porpoises. Before land was, before the water went down, before Noah, before the first chapter of Genesis. There is a baboon in me. Clambering clawed, dog-faced, yawping a galoot's hunger, hairy under the armpits. Here are the hawk-eyed, hankering men. Here are the blonde and blue-eyed women. And he, they hide, curled asleep, waiting, ready to snarl and kill, ready to sing and give milk, waiting. I keep the baboon because the wilderness says so. There is an eagle in me and a mockingbird, and the eagle flies among the rocky mountains of my dreams and fights among the Sierra crabs, crags of what I want. And the mockingbird warbles in the early forenoon before the dew is gone, warbles in the underbrush of my Chattanoogas of hope, gushes over the blue Ozark foothills of my wishes. And I got the eagle and the mockingbird from the wilderness. Oh, I got a zoo. I got a menagerie inside my ribs, under my bony head, under my red valve heart. And I got something else. It is a man-child heart. It is a woman-child heart. It is a father and mother and lover. It came from God knows where, and it is going God knows where. For I am the keeper of the zoo. I say yes and no. I sing and kill and work. I'm a pal of the world. I came from the wilderness.
comfort me. Comfort me. Comfort me, oh my soul. Comfort me. Comfort me. Comfort me, oh my soul. Sing with me. Sing. this on? Yeah. All right. Thanks, Tom. So, um, fairly early in my songwriting explorations, um, I decided I wanted to start writing songs that highlighted ways that my scientific understanding of biology enhanced my spiritual appreciation of nature. Um, and uh, as a kid, I learned that all species had evolved from a common ancestor through natural processes of mutation and natural selection. And the more I learned about that theory and the accumulated evidence, the more fascinated I became. Uh, but I knew lots of people who rejected evolution in favor of the biblical creation story in Genesis. And I heard many arguments to support that view, but none of them made much sense to me. One of those arguments was that accepting the truth of our evolutionary origins would somehow detract from people's spiritual sense of beauty and wonder at God's creation. And for me, that seemed like the silliest argument of all. Because learning about the true evolutionary histories of plants and animals only added to my sense that the world is a beautiful and wondrous place. As Charles Darwin once said, there is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. Now, there are lots of songs that celebrate the beauty of God's creation, but there are a lot fewer that celebrate beauty and wonder that we can derive from learning about the evolutionary history of species. Um, so, in writing this song, I tried to help fill that void. I don't remember if I've ever sung this at BUC. I don't think I have. Um, but I need your help because this song is supposed to be interactive. So each verse outlines the evolutionary history of a different species, and I want you to see if you can guess the name of each species by the end of its verse. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. If you have heard this before, maybe you can help people out, and I, I won't be waiting for too long. All right. They illuminate the summer night like a firework display. Their tails ablaze with golden light, but they weren't always this way. Getting brighter through the ages, generations at a time. Their history is beautiful, and their name is Firefly. Firefly. That one's easier. See how this one goes. Sweet voices call the world awake with a loving serenade. They sing for hours without a break, but they weren't always this way. To their music through the ages, generations add details. Their history is beautiful, and their name is... It's a bird. Nightingale. <laughs> Spring. 
sprinkled all along the avenue in a riotous bouquet. All their petals painted white and blue, but they weren't always this way. Colors deepen through the ages till the bees inspect their plot. Their history is beautiful and their name Forget me not good. <laughs> there are others lighting up the night and singing songs by day. They may clothe themselves in blue or white, but they weren't always this way. Building knowledge through the ages, generations at a time. Their history is beautiful, and their names are you and I. Their history is beautiful, and their names are you and I. Several years ago, when my kids' lives were in that sweet spot where they were independent young adults, but their schedules were not yet encumbered by careers and significant others, we took a family vacation touring the national parks of the Colorado Plateau. We drove hundreds of miles from park to park and hiked what seemed like hundreds of miles within those parks around the canyons in the Colorado Plateau. My daughter Bethany, the fittest and most type A among us, planned our hikes so that we encountered every rock and cactus, even remotely worth an encounter. <laughs> My middle child, Evan, a walking Wikipedia, spouted arcane facts about each rock and cactus that we encountered. My youngest, Colin, dropped occasional remarks with humor dry as those rocks and barbed as those cacti that made us laugh enough to almost forget our thirst and aching feet. What I remember most, though, was that for the most part, we walked in silence. It's clear in my memory that, to some degree, this was due to the pace that Bethany set. <laughs> but I also remember there was a much deeper influence on us. There was a constant awareness that the space we were in was old and big, old and big beyond comprehension. The most intense experience of this feeling came for me while standing on the southern rim of the Grand Canyon, looking into its immense space and unfathomable age, and feeling overwhelmingly aware that I am puny and brief. On the south rim of the Grand Canyon is a museum that explains the scientific understanding of the interaction between the Colorado River and the Colorado Plateau. I found myself separated from my family in that museum, eagerly absorbing all I could about what I had just hiked through. The museum was not very crowded, but on the other side of the main room, I noticed a group of about a dozen people, a handful of adults and presumably, pr presumably a bunch of their kids. They were listening to a fellow speaking authoritatively. I wandered over to eavesdrop, hoping to learn some new developments in geology not yet shown in the museum displays. I leaned in to hear what the fellow said. I heard him tell his audience that God had created the Grand Canyon in the Great Flood, that the Grand Canyon is a symbol of God's awesome power but loving restraint, and that the Grand Canyon was created in one event a few thousand years ago and has not changed since. This authoritative fellow was a biblical literalist teaching his followers the Bible explanation of the Grand Canyon. I left the museum as quickly as I could without actually breaking into a run. <laughs> For many years now, I have been thinking about this group of people 
How could our shared experience find such radically different expressions? I think the answer might lie in that two-dimensional space I proposed in the introduction to this service. Remember then that rather than thinking of science and spirituality as opposite directions along a single dimension, we imagine a two-dimensional space where along the horizontal axis, we have science expressed in what Michael Dowd calls day language. And along the vertical axis, we have spirituality expressed in what Dowd calls night language. Let's apply that idea to, to my experience of the Colorado Plateau. One component of this experience is along the x-axis, that is the mirror of the objective reality. The objective reality is the two billion year old history of the Colorado Plateau that saw shallow oceans silt up and disappear and, and mountain ranges rise and erode back down. All this while being relentlessly pushed heavenward, mostly intact, by surrounding tectonic activity, and finally being carved with deep canyons by erosion in the last few million years. This objective reality can, has been, and continues to be exposed by the process of scientific inquiry pursued by generations of geologists. It is clearly described in day language at that museum I mentioned. But there's another component of this experience along the y-axis that is the subjective experience I had of the Grand Canyon. It is for me the unavoidable awareness that the Grand Canyon induces in me that I am part of something incomprehensibly huge in both space and time. This component of the experience is not commensurable. That is, I can't compare this component of my experience with this component of the experience of anyone else with anything like real meaning. It is purely subjective. And I need metaphor to even approach a description. I need day language. One of the things that attracted me to Unitarian Universalism was the explicit reference in our principles to the search for truth and meaning. It's easy to take these two words, truth and meaning, as sort of a unitary whole, meaning something like what it's all about. But I believe these two words were chosen specifically because they describe the two complementary aspects of experiencing life as a human. You might already see that they fit nicely in our two-dimensional space. Truth is along the x-axis, is revealed by science, and is expressed in day language. Meaning is along the y-axis, is revealed through personal experience, and is expressed by night language. Now, I truly believe that the biblical literalist and his followers in that museum are like us here at BUC, searching for truth and meaning. But we are taking two different paths. Whereas we use at BUC declare ourselves free and responsible in that search, these fellow seekers are consciously or unconsciously bound by and surrender their agency to authority and tradition. The consequence is that they are forced to combine both the truth and meaning of their experience into one story, which to many like us is inadequate to the demands of truth and unsatisfactory in providing meaning. This might explain why the world is full of nuns. No, not that kind of nun, N-U-N. In this context, a nun, N-O-N-E, is that person who, when asked what religion they are associated with, responds with none. According to the Pew Research Center, 28% of adults in the US consider themselves unaffiliated with any religion. They are nuns. Moreover, fully two thirds of these nuns object to organized religion because of skepticism about religious teachings. As Unitarian Universalists at BUC, we have found our way past dubious religious teachings. Our day language is science. It is based on principles which are free of authority and tradition. 
It is malleable and subject to, updated based, up, subject to update based on new evidence and reason. Our night language is as rich as the collected artistic and religious expression of all of history. For us here at BUC, there is no conflict between the language of truth and the language of meaning. I would be surprised if my fellow seekers of truth and meaning at that museum would willingly reject authority and tradition for our approach. But think of all those people who call themselves none out there, who have already rejected authority and tradition. How many of you were once nuns? We're talking about the right nuns here, right? <laughs> Consider that somewhere around one in five people that you meet at random on the street have already taken the first step toward BUC. I hope someday we figure out how to show them the end of the journey, the open doors at BUC. May it be so. Me again. <laughs> so Chris has referenced uh, uh, Michael Dowd's day language, night language uh, quite a lot. And I actually met Michael Dowd in 2009 when he was on tour publicizing his book that at the time had just come out, Thank God for Evolution. And um, I, uh, I, I was really taken by this concept. Um, so uh, uh, Dow believed that too much of our religious night language, like the biblical creation story, has become hopelessly out of step with modern science. And in particular, Dow criticized traditional re religious conceptions of good versus evil and of mental health versus mental illness as arising from angelic and demonic spirits. That was something he really focused on quite a lot. Um, as he said, angels and demons might have been useful ways for our ancestors to make sense of complex human thoughts and behaviors, but Dowd believed we need new metaphors, new night language, that better reflects scientific knowledge about neuroscience and evolutionary psychology. Um, so Dowd promoted uh, uh, an old model of the brain called the triune brain as a useful night language metaphor to help people make sense of complex human minds. So the idea is that different aspects of our complex personalities emerge at different points in our deep evolutionary past in response to different types of selection pressure. And given that complex history, is it any wonder that our brains sometimes work in complex and contradictory ways? At the time I met him, I was in the middle of a serious struggle with clinical anxiety and depression. And I found it helpful to imagine my mental struggles as a conflict between my reptile mind and my monkey mind, or perhaps as inheritance from my stressed out little mammalian ancestors, <laughs> rather than as something evil lurking within me. Now, as a practicing biologist, I need to note, uh, uh, since I'm talking about the uh, history of the song, that the triune brain concept originated as a hypothesis for the order in which different brain lobes evolved, and as uh, uh, and in that sense, the triune brain is a seriously outdated hypothesis, and I wouldn't teach it as literally true in the day language of uh, a vertebrate anatomy course, which I used to teach. Um, however, I really liked Dowd's night language approach, and I decided to put it to music. So this next song is called My Monkey Mind. Some of you have heard it. Um, and uh, I would really like it if you join me for the chorus. So here's how the chorus goes. My, my monkey mind, whoa, whoa, whoa. Ah. Monk, my monkey mind. Maybe I should just start at the beginning because I'm in the wrong <laughs> key now. <laughs> my monkey mind, my monkey mind. It's not always right, but it thinks all the time. All right, so give that a try. My monkey mind, my monkey mind. It's not always right, but it thinks all the time. All right, last part. 
My monkey minds, my monkey minds, my imperfect monkey minds. All right. My monkey minds, my monkey minds, my imperfect monkey minds. All right, you ready? My brain first evolved for the ocean and not for the world of today. My thoughts get confused by emotion and instinct can lead me astray. For lizard mind cares only that I fill my basic needs And a lonely inner mammal wants affection for me, please And soon my head is spinning with solutions to appease The pieces of my monkey mind My monkey mind, my monkey mind It's not always right, but it thinks all the time My monkey mind, my monkey mind My imperfect monkey mind My mind can get anxious or fretful Emotions get angry or sad But life would be so uneventful If logic were all that I had For though lizard mind cares only that I fill my basic needs And a lonely inner mammal wants affection for me, please They help to drive the passion and the creativity Residing in my monkey mind My monkey mind, my monkey mind It's not always right, but it thinks all the time My monkey mind, my monkey mind My imperfect monkey mind There's really no shame in admitting Our link to those tree swinging days just think what a crime we're committing Denying the progress we've made For though lizard mind cares only that we fill our basic needs And a lonely inner mammal wants affection for us, please What triumphs and discoveries will all our children see In thanks to our monkey minds Our monkey minds, our monkey minds they're not always right, but they think all the time Our monkey minds, our monkey minds Our beautiful monkey minds Our monkey minds, our monkey minds Our monkey minds, our monkey Our monkey minds, our monkey minds Monkey, 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 monkey Beautiful monkey minds Our monkey minds, our monkey minds they're not always right, but they think all the time Our monkey minds, our monkey minds Our imperfect time-wasting, test-taking, song-making, ground-breaking monkey minds Have you noticed how we pray as Unitarian Universalists? Spirit of... <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Spirit of life and love. Great mystery of life. Higher power. Spirit of wisdom. Marvelous truth. Sacred one. Great spirit. The force. You of many names or no name at all. They who must not be named. G oh, I almost said the G word. <laughs> For many of us, particularly those who came to UUism after belonging to a faith tradition that just didn't cut it for us anymore, it's difficult to talk of uh, God. There, I said it. M my problem with talking about God was best summed up by an anecdote that Doug Gallagher relayed when he was the senior minister at BUC. Someone would say to him, I don't believe in God. And Doug, an avowed theist, would respond, tell me about the God that you don't believe in. I probably don't believe in, in him either. In other words, for me, it was a definitional problem. And the word God was understood by most people most of the time as the sky God, a great white father who zapped the world into being and to whom you prayed when you were in trouble. 
Having left the Catholic Church, I generally identify as being even atheist or an agnostic. When the choir sang the Credo from Schubert's Mass, I would say that uh, what I believed from the Nicene Creed was recited or sung as part, which is recited or sung as part of the Catholic Mass, would go like this: Credo in, I, that is, I believe in, and, and nothing further. If I were to believe in a god, it would be the god of the Reverend Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who was a Catholic priest, scientist, paleontologist, and philosopher in the early 1900s. To put it simply, revisiting Teilhard 50 years after my first reading of his posthumously published book, The Phenomenon of Man, I have expanded my acceptance of the Nicene Creed from credo in to credo in unum deum, that is, I believe in one God, but it is not the God of the rest of the Nicene Creed. Beliefs evolve. Our son Benjamin wrote his first credo statement at the end of eighth grade. There was also a tradition at BUC that the RE students had a chance to update their credo statements as they end ended their senior year of high school and bridged into young adulthood. This is a tribute to our living tradition and most importantly, to our ongoing search for truth and meaning. How then would I update my credo statement? So, my credo formed by some key moments in my life. I sit alone in a darkened Gothic chapel at a Catholic seminary in the middle of the night, taking my turn to pray or meditate as part of 40 hour devotion. I am alone in my meditation but the deeper I go within myself, the more I feel something far greater than myself. I am in a choir at Michigan State University where 600 choir members are singing Brahms' Requiem, along with a couple hundred students in the orchestra. Immersed in the music that we are making, I feel something far greater than myself. I stand on a mountaintop with my dad in the Colorado Rockies and look out at an equally tall mountain 75 miles away. I think about the expanse in distance as well as the expanse in time. These mountains have been forming for an estimated 75 million years and they are still relatively young. I experience the feeling of transcendence, realizing how small I am in space and time, yet how I am a very part of this vastness. I feel something far greater than myself. I meet and fall in love with Mary Gowell. We build a relationship. I feel something far greater than myself and greater than the two of us together. I belong to a beloved community at Birmingham Unitarian Church. Over the years, I realized that relationships created here between all of us during Sunday worship connects those who came before us and those who will come after us. And I feel something far greater than myself. Transcendence in meditation, in music, in nature, in a close intimate relationship, in a beloved church community. It feels like all these experiences are connected. But connected to what? As an atheist or agnostic, I can't say that I am connected to God. But Teilhard and others began to develop a completely new definition of God in the 20th century. Not a God that created the world at one time in the distant past, be it 6,000 years ago or 13.8 billion years ago, God is not the creator. God is the goal. In some respects, Teilhard resurrects the belief that God is everything, which is called pantheism. This is a religion that came before the major world religions were founded 2,500 to 1,500 years ago. But Teilhard's pantheism is not the early attempts to explain the pre-scientific world through the creation of gods. Nor is, is it the medieval Christian theology that separates the spiritual from the scientific and the physical from the mental realms. Teilhard's theology is based primarily on evolution. Evolution helps us to begin to understand that humanity is not separate from nature, but we are a part of nature and its processes. Along the way, evolution manifests transitions. 
A phase transition is when a sufficient amount of quantitative change leads to a qualitative change. For example, liquid water warms up quantitatively until it reaches 212 degrees Fahrenheit and qualitatively changes into steam. Evolutionary phase changes move from chemical changes to a phase change when chemistry becomes living as single cell organisms. These organisms evolve and with increasing complexity start to exhibit what we would call consciousness. While we can say that there is a phase change in consciousness within the evolution of hominids, we need to recognize prior phase changes in the development of consciousness, each building on the previous change. And looking back through the evolutionary past, we really can't point to a time when there wasn't some form of rudimentary consciousness. As Teilhard puts it, quote, man discovers that he is nothing else than evolution become conscious of itself. The consciousness of each of us is evolution looking at itself and reflecting back on itself. Einstein's theories of relativity and the theories of quantum mechanics add co additional components to support a new religion. Prior to the 20th century, our scientific understanding was based on matter and distinct from it, energy that moves around, moves things around. But energy can become matter. Matter can become energy. E equals mc squared. Quantum mechanics and particle entanglements start to raise the possibility that the mind and matter are as intertwined as matter and energy. The mind emerges from the physical matter of the brain in an individual. But beyond our individual consciousness, there is collective consciousness. Teilhard would say that this emerging collective consciousness is God emerging from creation. I would say that my transcendent experiences are connected to God. Teilhard challenges us to create a new religion that is based on the relational complexity of becoming. At its core, God is an emergent property of creation completely entangled with all of it. Our challenge as you use is to build a religion deeply based in science and spirituality that not only finds God through science, but consciously joins in the creation of God of which we are a part. Creating this religion challenges us to fuse the entangled dimensions of science and spirituality. And in reclaiming God language in a new way, we can be just as open to the metaphorical night language of spirituality as we are open to the day language of science. As you use, we have led the way in critiquing religious ideas that have outlived their meaning. Might we be able to provide a new spiritual home for those looking for this next step in their journey? All right, please uh, join me in our final hymn. This is uh, hymn number 1064 in the Teal Hymnal. We know it well, it's Blue Boat Home.
We extinguish our chalice to the words of Percy Bysshe Shelley, an, er an excerpt from the Hymn of Apollo. I am the eye with which the universe beholds itself and knows it is divine. All harmony of instrument or verse, all prophecy, all medicine is mine, all light of art or nature. To my song, victory and praise in its own right belong. Go now into this world as a beacon of hope and joy. Go in love, go in peace. Now that our worship has ended, our service begins. May it be so. Amen. Blessed be.